our next speaker is Monica Defont from Amundi, Europe's largest asset manager and a top 10 global player. We've worked closely with Amundi in the last couple of years, and with their help, we redesigned the Momentum Global Fixed Income Fund as a more systematic global government bond strategy, adopting more of a factor-based investment process, and results today have been very encouraging. Monica is Global Head of Group Research and a member of the Global Investment Committee and the Advisory Board, helping to shape Amundi's investment strategy on financial markets. In the years following the financial crisis, and throughout the COVID pandemic, monetary policy has driven financial assets to new highs in most asset classes, and inflation is poised, perhaps, to continue to move higher, making investment choices less of a one-way street going forward. Policymakers' guidance all the more important. To talk about this more, over to you, Monica. Good morning, my name is Monica Defend. I'm heading the Global Research Department at Amundi, and I'm very pleased to share with you today our findings on investing in a post-pandemic world. We are convinced the pandemic accounts for regime shifts that are affecting the macro dynamic, including a larger role role played by uh, policy makers that is actually penciling a new macro financial ecosystem. The pandemic is affecting the financial markets. The larger role uh, of the uh, policy makers is actually changing the asset classes specific drivers and eventually it is going to change and evolve our approach uh, to portfolio construction and long-term convictions. This is the agenda we will have today. Let's get started. The first subject in the agenda today is to have a look on how the pandemic has been altering the macro dynamics. We see a larger role played by the um, policy makers and everything connects to everything else even more today. We had a global shock that is having global spillovers. Let's take an example, the supply chain disruptions. Supply chain disruptions is a, are a reflection of this, of this deglobalization trend that has been, was in, in the political debate before the pandemic, but with the pandemic turned to be a material issue. Being too globalized actually um, meant uh, to be uh, short of certain uh, items uh, that were needed uh, during the, uh, the, the pandemic. And this is having, um, this deglobalization will have short term and long term uh, implication when referred to the labor market, inequalities, social impact, social costs policymakers' decision and uh, debt accumulation and debt sustainability. Let's have a look uh, more, uh, more narrowly uh, to uh, the uh, labor market, for example. Unemployment uh, is a, a real issue. Uh, in the um, slide uh, number five, uh, you can see the US evidence at uh, sector level. And, and you realize how the labor market is, uh, um, is impaired and fragmented with certain sectors that uh, have been hit the most, namely hospitalization, leisure, transportation. These are long-term scars that uh, will, will really take time before uh, they, can, uh, they can get covered. The same uh, is uh, happening in the, in the euro area, where, for example, the gap between unemployment and youth unemployment is getting wider. Unemployment implies inequalities. Inequalities and uh, unemployment are really uh, labeling the, the social virus that is an issue that is, that is headed on top on the, on the, on the COVID-19. Moreover, in the next slide, you see how we do expect over the next 20 years a rebalancing between capital and labor uh, 
in terms of contribution to national income formation. For years, the uh, advances in technology, uh, the um, reduction of transaction cost, set, set, so um, larger role of, of capital. We now expect total factor of productivity to, to rebalance and lab contribution to be higher. This is a plus because it will imply higher consumption, higher consumption expenditure is having a positive contribution to, to GDP growth, but it will come uh, with, a, with an higher uh, cost in terms of volatility. These are elements you need to consider when assessing your capital market uh, assumption. Deglobalization. Deglobalization uh, was up in the political debate before the pandemic, but is uh, coming real. After the Second World War, we have seen world trade really moving fast. The uh, rate of change of world trade was twice the rate of change of GDP growth. With the global financial crisis, we have seen a slowdown in this, in this pattern. And actually, 2010, 2012, as you see in the chart on the uh, left-hand side, we had a peak. But that was the end of the great globalization. With world trade uh, diminishing because uh, um, governments are relocating some of, of their production, we do expect the business cycles to be more decorrelated moving forward. This decorrelation in the growth dynamics, this multi-speed recovery that we are actually seeing, implies possibility of diversification where the growth uh, macro factor is uh, the, the discriminant at portfolio level. Rates and inflation. In, the, in our textbook, we have been studying that uh, at a time of growing growth and inflation moving higher, the long end of the curve, the 10-year uh, government rates, for example, usually moves higher. This is not taking place today. There is really, this is a relation that is uh, turning upside down. We measure that the, um, the rationale uh, for this uh, disconnection between uh, macro fundamentals and uh, financial dynamics relates to the unconventional monetary policy. Namely, as we will see later in the presentation, the balance sheet expansion efforts that central banks have been displayed for ages. It is not bad to have uh, uh, low long-term rates because at the same time, governments have been accumulating large uh, levels of, of debt that will need to be uh, paid down. Moreover, if uh, we consider the aging trend that is uh, a global phenomenon, including also those countries that uh, were uh, young by definition, Middle East, uh, the Nordics, the trend is really uh, going uh, towards aging population. In the charts, you see how the max minimum age is moving higher. There are few exceptions. For example, in France, this tendency is le less marked than in the other countries. But nevertheless, this is an important element to be considered while assessing capital market assumption. Then we have the geopolitical order. The virus, the social virus, have a cost and are pressing on, the, um, on, on governments. We are entering a season where most of the countries globally will have a political election and the new uh, governments will uh, have to tackle with this uh, uh, social uh, instability and try to, to reorder and reassess their social welfare, for example. Globally, uh, we've seen a change in the uh, US presidency and this is a kind of altering and requiring a new equilibrium in the global geopolitical board. The US, China, Middle East, Russia and eventually Europe. To conclude, political, 
policymakers are try, need to seek the triplete just to uh, mention uh, a word that is used in the uh, football uh, jargon. But we really need uh, policymakers to be effective in the uh, implementation of the decision uh, that they've been taking. We need fiscal policy to dominate and to become even more important than monetary policy, where monetary policy is there to buy time and maintain low rates in order for the uh, fiscal policy to be fully displayed. Low rates will allow that, that sustainability in the long term, but in the more short term will create um, a benign environment for corporate margins and eventually corporate earnings formation. Let's move to the second subject uh, I'd like to cover and to uh, detect, aimed at detecting what are the profound shifts in the financial market dynamics induced by the, the pandemic. We think that market narratives will dominate investors' uh, market convictions. Narratives uh, is a, a term uh, that Robert Schiller used in order to uh, define investors' beliefs that affect individual and a collective economic behavior. If you are able to detect a narrative in advance, then it will be easier for you to build portfolios that are resilient to uh, financial recessions or uh, economic recession. And this is how we are progressively moving and the lenses that we are using to look through the market dynamics. There are four elements that uh, we believe uh, underpin uh, the, the market's uh, dynamics, uh, the market's narrative formation. The policy dependence, the inflation regime, lower expected return and rising uh, correlations. Well, let's have a look at each of these uh, uh, four elements. When you talk about policy dependency, we already anticipated this uh, in the uh, previous session. Basically, we are seeing how uh, the policymakers are overwhelming asset classes of specific drivers. Usually, uh, when we had to uh, define the fair value for the 10 years government bond, we said, well, you need growth and you need inflation forecast. This is not enough. It is not uh, explaining the, the current level uh, of rates. The same applies uh, to equity markets uh, valuations. We are convinced that because of this uh, protracted period of uh, unconventional monetary policy, the monetary factor has to be included into uh, the uh, valuation pattern for, uh, for uh, asset classes. Um, in, in, the, in the chart in the slide, uh, I report an, an example that refers to the S&P 500. The growth narrative envisages the S&P 500 to move uh, along forecasts in terms of uh, GDP growth, uh, earning per share growth, uh, unemployment forecast, uh, oil prices. But you see, and, and this is reported in the, in the flat blue line, but current market dynamics are really moving much higher. This narrative is not working. So what we did was to take explicitly uh, into account the monetary factor that was, uh, uh, that was proxying the Fed balance sheet expansion over time. And we used that proxy in order to rebalance and um, retarget uh, our price earning uh, ratio, so the, our valuation tools. And this is exactly what you see again on the, uh, on the, flat, uh, on the flat blue line. In the, in the recent months, the monetary factor explained how valuation in the equity market were not so expensive. Today, even with these uh, metrics, uh, we get into the conclusion the S&P 500 is uh, fairly valued. Another important element is inflation. We have been uh, surprised by uh, the continued uh, CPI and uh, production price index on the rise, but actually we were already talking about an inflation regime shift. 
It is important uh, to uh, identify regime uh, on the selected variables such as inflation as uh, we, we measured that financial markets tend to have a persistency in terms of uh, dynamic they show over time depending on the regime you are in. And in the chart you see how we clustered inflation and how we plug in our inflation expectations. So we entered a regime shift in inflation in 2021 and then we expect to uh, gradually uh, move down but to a low but higher uh, in inflation rate when compared to the pre-crisis uh, inflationary regime. Well, the results in terms of asset class dynamics are reported in the following slide where you see that uh, the S&P 500 is uh, a, a must have. It's uh, um, the best performing uh, asset classes at time of inflation moving higher but remaining uh, contained. The macro assumption in terms of growth, inflation, uh, labor market dynamics, aging, inequalities, uh, total factor productivity help us in uh, deriving our capital market assumption that when, com when you compare our 10-year expectations with the last 10 years return, you see how uh, returns are going to be lower and uh, correlation are going to move higher. This, is, uh, this has uh, obviously um, some, impl some relevant implication when we are asked to derive the strategic asset allocation for a client. Long-term convictions. We think that uh, a factor-based approach will likely help us empowering the search for cross-asset opportunities and will help us to build robust um, portfolios that delivers decent risk return, where our expectation is for lower expected return to be delivered in the next 10 years. There are some uh, profound uh, shifts in the portfolio decision making and we need to be ready to rebalance risk premium and design our portfolios accordingly. There are few challenges that the uh, um, um, balanced portfolio, uh, the 60, traditional 60-40 uh, uh, um, allocation will face for US investors and for Euro-denominated investors. If in the past US investors were used to get expected return around 9%, they will be slashed to below 4%. And the same applies for, to European investors. Equity is no alternative in uh, an asset allocation. Then, uh, if you look at the absolute valuation, they are expensive, both for uh, equity and, and bond investors, and the only game in town will be to play in the relative space. This will induce us to rethink the portfolio allocation on the fixed income front Bonds will need, uh, bonds investor will need to go beyond the benchmark. Benchmark today is, uh, today have uh, higher duration, lower yield, and uh, equity, when inflation is going to move structurally higher, is a must have in the portfolios. So what we have been doing over time, and this uh, has been emphasized and accelerated uh, by, by the pandemic, has been to enlarge the investment universe and to look to real asset, alternative asset and the full emerging market spectrum in order to improve the risk return profile of our portfolios. As you see in, uh, on slide 23, uh, this is possible when those asset classes are nested into the traditional asset allocation. ESG has become an urgency. We have seen it during the pandemic how to cover the cost of the sure benefit in the, um, the unemployment scheme um, display, uh, put in place by authorities in the euro area. We, uh, we issued uh, sure bonds. This has been, uh, there has been really a good take up by investors, but we think that the next wave will, will be into the green transition issuance. 
Today, the ESG um, bond market uh, is quite tiny. It's a 1% compared to the uh, full, um, full sovereign uh, emissions, but the trend is, uh, is moving higher. This is applied applying also in the um, in the equity space it is not only um, an evolution that is in place in europe but is um, well present in the us as well as in, uh, in in asia to conclude we think that partitioning uh, the, the portfolio, having in mind that the fixed income component needs to be uh, to move to unconstrained strategies, moving beyond uh, the benchmark and govis are likely uh, to serve as a liquidity buffer is the way to address the fixed income component in a balanced portfolio. On the equity side, equity is a must-have amid uh, inflation uh, regime moving higher. We need to look at thematic solution and macro factor diversified uh, equity exposure when it goes to dividends, uh, growth, emerging market. And moreover, we expect the rotation from growth to value to persist uh, over, over time. Then the last uh, piece of the puzzle is, uh, refers uh, to, um, to real asset and uh, alternative that are likely to be decorrelated from the traditional asset classes and will help us uh, into building the final strategic asset allocation of our portfolio. But now let's see uh, what we do expect in a more short term horizon. I'm now asking you a very last effort in order to uh, look with me, to have a look with me uh, to our current positionings and um, recommendation for the remainder of the year. We think that the triple D, delta, deceleration and divergences are the themes that are going to dominate financial markets dynamics for the remainder uh, of the year. Over the summer, investors turn to the too much inflation narrative into not enough uh, growth uh, narrative. Economic momentum is decelerating on both sides uh, of the Pacific. In China, primarily because of the uh, Delta, uh, Delta variant and the induced lockdowns. In the US, it is normalizing after the very fast uh, restart. We think that growth is, uh, is going to progressively uh, normalize uh, to trend over the next uh, two, two years. At the same time, inflation, as we saw, is moving higher and we are currently already uh, in a high inflation regime that will be abating progressively um, into lower readings, but higher when compared to uh, pre-crisis uh, level entering 2022. We think that uh, we expect in the US to have inflation above 1% for 2021, moving to the three plus um, <clears throat> rate in uh, 2022, while in the euro area, we are going to stay around 2%. Central banks, uh, are going to be pivotal as usual, but we think that the central bank's meetings in the pipeline won't be game changers in terms of rate direction, but they will be key events amid volatility in the, in the market. But uh, let's have a look uh, to our current positioning. We are neutral on the equity, star, on the equity exposure, the reason is that the economic backdrop is abating to a more um, normal rate of change and the Delta variant is actually uh, a risk uh, that uh, is uh, tilting to the, to the downside, although we do believe the market is a little bit overestimating it. Central banks will be there in order to manage the uncertainty related to the normalization of the uh, economic cycle. We said that uh, uh, it is not time to take uh, strong directional bets, but to be very active in the relative positioning. And the growth factor, again, is something that will help us discriminating 
between regions, for example, and this explains our preference for European equities versus US equities. We think that uh, European equities are, have not reached the peak. The momentum uh, in terms of uh, in, in economic terms uh, still have uh, to uh, to expand further, while uh, we see that the policy divergence uh, on the monetary front will benefit European equities. We prefer value defensive stocks. The valuation dispersion is a quite um, quite ample at a single stock level, and this emphasizes uh, the role uh, for uh, alpha alpha players. Um, a sector level, uh, we have a preference for healthcare, financial, industrial while we are underweighting consumer discretionary. Again, we are seeking for idiosyncratic stock-specific stories, uh, trying to minimize uh, the, the deep value or the distressed uh, value on emerging market. Emerging market, uh, unfortunately, uh, has been lagging uh, on the uh, vaccination campaign. We think that uh, the, the worst is uh, behind uh, the LATAM countries, that's why uh, we are uh, constructive on, on Brazil, while uh, on Asia it's time to be, uh, to be neutral, with the only exception of, of India, but on China, uh, because uh, of the economic momentum uh, deceleration and the uh, regulation efforts that have been displayed by the authorities, we turn to um, a neutral exposure with a preference for sectors that are more insulated from this regulation process, namely clean energy and biotech uh, stock. On the fixed income side, we are short US and core uh, duration. We are short UK uh, governments. We expect rates uh, to move higher on improving uh, growth dynamics and double market dynamics as well as uh, inflation prints. We have a preference for, for credit. Credit is uh, showing, is moving along improving uh, fundamentals. If you look at the uh, cash flow baskets in the, in the balance sheets uh, and in the uh, add to the earnings uh, formation, and we have a preference for the peripheral countries in the uh, Euro area, namely Italy, that, uh, that are showing uh, a nice uh, carry. On the emerging uh, market front, we turn again uh, more, uh, more cautious. We retain a preference for hard currency bonds high yield in particular uh, Chinese bonds is uh, uh, nice to have uh, in, the, in the portfolio. Overall, I would say that we are cautious but we are not uh, pessimistic. We really need to be very agile and moving fast, tempering the risk budgeting on the, of the uh, total portfolio exposure but being very active in the uh, relative space where the narratives are really opening up some good opportunities. Thank you for listening and I'm happy uh, to answer to your questions.